Welcome back, everyone. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today I want to talk to you guys about Pseudo Dionysius and his mystical theology. Now, some of you guys may already be familiar with Pseudo Dionysius, and he is a very influential figure on the development of Christian theology, Christian mysticism, and therefore I thought it'd be very important uh, and useful to discuss directly his mystical theology. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. We're going to first kind of contextualize who this figure is. Why do we call him Pseudo Dionysius? And his relationship to Dionysius the Areopagite, as referred to in Acts chapter 17, verse 34. We're going to discuss his influence upon major figures in the Christian church and Christian history. And then we're going to read his entire mystical theology. And so there is going to be a considerable amount of reading in this video. However, I think it's very interesting. And his mystical theology is really novel in the way in which it reapproaches a sort of conceptualization of God or, or a beyond a conceptualization of God. So his mysticism, we're not going to be talking about uh, mystical visions, mystical kind of phenomenology. Um, it's more of a conceptualization. It, it, it's, a, it's novel in the sense of approaching God beyond categories, transcendent of any created description, or as he frames it, affirmative descriptions of God. So this relates to a previous video I made on apophatic versus cataphatic theology. Pseudo Dionysius is famous for his apophatic theology, and it's, and it's this negative approach as opposed to the positive or affirmative approach to God that yields a tremendous impact on the development of Christian theology, Christian mysticism. And so that's where we're going to get into. And, and one of the kind of motifs we're going to see in his mystical theology is related to this apophatic or cataphatic approach is for him cataphatic or as he describes it affirmative or assertive approaches to God is a movement from God to the world as opposed to what he terms negative or apophatic theology is a movement from the world towards God. And this is why it's mystical. This is why it's mysticism, is that mysticism by definition is a union with God or the unio mystica, the kind of traditional definition of mysticism. And that's why we call it mystical theology. So that's what we're going to get into today. And uh, with that being said, let's just dive into it. So first, Pseudo Dionysius, who is he? Uh, what's his dates? He is a late 5th century, early 6th century Christian theologian, and he is, you know, falsely identifies himself as Dionysius the Areopagite, who is an Athenian convert to Christianity as described in the book of Acts. So Paul, preaching to the Athenians, converts a handful of people after discussing the resurrection of the unknown God. And it is this that I actually want to read and connect with you to his sort of apophatic approach to God, the kind of novel approach that he's known for, and connect maybe something that I haven't seen anybody directly reference in regards to the unknown God. So before we even get further into who he was and his influence, I would like to briefly read a couple paragraphs from the book of Acts. And this is Acts chapter 17, and we're going to start with verse 22. Now, this is the church of Athens. Paul is in Athens, and he's evangelizing to the Athenians, trying to convert them to Christianity. And so, starting at uh, verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, 
so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Now, what I wanted to highlight that I had never heard anybody directly reference is the unknown God being the kind of catalyst that converts this figure, Dionysius the Areopagite, and then the unknowability of God being the staple of pseudo-Dionysius' theology. Now, maybe he chose this figure in the book of Acts because the sort of unknowability or the unknown God that Paul is saying is Christ um, or is the Logos, however you want to say that, connects with his apophatic approach to God. I don't know. I've never heard anybody make that reference. I think it's interesting. Maybe there's something there in terms of why he chose to be identified as Dionysius the Areopagite. So, Because he identified as Dionysius the Areopagite, his theology was taken very seriously within the Christian church, and it actually wasn't until the modernist period, till the 19th century, that he was redated to the late 5th, early 6th century. And this is because of dimensions of his theology kind of place him in a historical context, one of those being the sort of Neoplatonic elements to his theology. Um, For example as will be referenced in our readings today, and I believe it's in chapter 2, I'm not positive though, he uses the kind of metaphor, the analogy of a sculptor, and how for Pseudo-Dionysius, his apophatic, his negative approach to God is synonymous with a sculptor moving rock, taking debris, moving material away from whatever you know, you're sculpting until you get to the hidden beauty of the object. And so he's saying that his negative, his apophatic approach is like the same process theologically as a sculptor sculpting away the kind of dead debris around the beauty of the creation. Uh, Of course, God's not created, but you see the similarities in this approach. And because this is very similar and reminiscent to Plotinus, people say, whoa, 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 hold a minute. Uh, that sounds just like Plotinus. Maybe he is post, uh, you know, maybe he, we should rethink his dating. And then there's other dimensions to his theology that helped scholars redate him. So, um, like I said, he's a major figure on both the Eastern and Western church, uh, mysticisms particularly. And you could see how his apophatic approach to God, his, his negative approach to theology would be akin to the essence energy distinction that is a kind of a dogma within the Eastern Orthodox Church, and that this transcendental unknowability of the essence of God is essential, essential to Orthodox theology and its ability to be beyond any type of dialectical tension in their theology. Um, this would certainly be at odds with the cataphatic approach of Protestantism, which is always describing what God is. Uh, There isn't a whole lot of apophatic theology in Protestantism. And in fact, most would say there's not a whole lot of mysticism. And this would coincide with what I was saying earlier, is that the apophatic approach for Dionysius, for the Eastern Orthodox Church, is a mystical approach to God. It's a moving upward towards God, as he would call it, an ascent towards God. And uh, this would also be at odds with let's say, Thomas Aquinas and, and his absolute divine simplicity of the, court, of the uh, Catholic 
Thomist theological tradition, in that it, the absolute divine simplicity is akin to a sort of Neoplatonic um, oneness. Everything is subsumed into the one, and there's a sort of, sort of blurring of the essence of the one into what Thomas Aquinas calls the exemplars, even though, as we will highlight, Thomas Aquinas was greatly, greatly influenced by Pseudo Dionysius. And so the reception of his mystical theology, of his theology generally, was taken in multiple directions. Some took it in a Neoplatonic uh, direction. Some took it towards the absolute divine simplicity direction, as in Aquinas. Um, And some took it towards the Eastern Orthodox kind of transcendent uh, essence energy distinction. So just wanted to highlight that. Another interesting thing is where he attributes his inspiration from. He says it comes from his master, who we now refer to as pseudo Hierotheus. And we call him pseudo Hierotheus because many scholars now believe that who he claimed his master was is actually a 5th century Syrian monk named Stephen Bar Sudhaley. So that's another reason why uh, he's kind of redated to where he is in the late 5th, early 6th century. And... Um, as I've already mentioned, the way he frames, he doesn't use apophatic and cataphatic to describe his approaches. He uses negative and affirmative theology. And so we're going to hear that over and over again while we read his mystical theology. And then some of the influence he had on the Western tradition, I think, is pretty tremendous. And that would begin with, of course, Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas actually refers to pseudo Dionysius over 1,700 times in his Summa Theologica. So, uh, obviously, major, major influence. I mean, he's the most referenced individual in his Summa Theologica. Um, and then also people like Meister Eckhart. So, uh, I have his classics of Western spirituality here. And again, I highly recommend, if I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, the classics of Western spirituality is a kind of a book series. Um, that I would greatly recommend. You know, I have um, Maximus the Confessor, Gregory Palamas, Philo, Simeon the New Theologian. Um, If I was a wealthier man, I'd have more of them. But uh, definitely recommend that book series if you're interested in these things, or if you're interested in the complete works of Dionysius, I highly recommend uh, this book. Um, Another figure that was greatly influenced by Pseudo-Dionysius is Bonaventure. And in fact, I'll be making a video on Bonaventure, um, from this book, uh, this is by Bernard McGinn, um, and Bonaventure's The Mind's Journey into God, and it's just a, it's a bridged version, so it only has prologue and chapter one and seven, but I plan on making a video reading that because it's very poetic, very beautiful, and makes multiple references to what we're going to be reading today. But uh, Bonaventure is another video that I'll be making, but another influenced um, individual by Pseudo Dionysius. Who else? Uh, Nicholas of Cusa, Dennis the Carthusian, uh, Julian of Norwich, which is the, she's a woman, and she's the first woman to write really any theological writings in English. Uh, we also have a couple Carlamites, um, uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, also mystics that are greatly influenced by Pseudo Dionysius. Now, his works in his This is the complete works. What we have are the divine names, another famous kind of um, um, treatises that he has, the divine names, his celestial hierarchy, very influential in, in Christian understandings of angelology and angels. So his celestial hierarchy, ecclesiastical hierarchy, his mystical theology, which I'll be reading today, and then his epistles. Now, there are multiple works of pseudo Dionysius that we don't have, and there's a bit of a debate whether they're actually real or false. Now, I personally align with the tradition that says they're probably real. We just be, have they been lost to history. Now, another faction of scholars believe that no, these works probably never existed and that he just made them up and used them in his writings to kind of make his corpus seem larger and kind of uh, make his ideas seem more justified than they really are. That there is no real evidence for that other than a speculation. So I tend to go with the idea that they're probably real. They've just been lost to history. (coughs) And those include um, his symbolic theology, which is going to be referenced in his mystical theology. Really wish 
I could read his symbolic theology, which he claims is a whole discussion on how to understand God through analogy and symbolism. His theological outlines on angelic properties and orders, on the just and divine judgment, on the soul, on intelligible and sensible beings, and on divine hymns, all of which we don't have, but he references as if they exist. He wrote them, and they're important uh, kind of treatises of ideas uh, according to Pseudo Dionysius. So, with that being said, that's really all the kind of uh, prologue I have. It's now time to get into his mystical theology. Um, and so, we're going to be reading, like I said, the whole thing. We're starting with chapter one. Uh, what is divine darkness? And he begins with a prayer, and he says, Trinity, higher than any being, any divinity, any goodness, guide of Christians, in the wisdom of heaven, lead us up beyond all knowing and light, up to the farthest highest peak of mystic scripture, where the mysteries of God's word lie simple, absolute, and unchangeable in the brilliant darkness of a hidden silence. Amid the deepest shadow, they pour overwhelming light on what is most manifest. Amid the holy unseen, unsensed and unseen, they completely fill our sightless minds with treasures beyond all beauty. For this I pray, and Timothy, my friend, my advice to you as you look for a sight of the mysterious things is to leave behind you everything perceived and understood, everything perceptible and understandable, all that is not and all that is, and with your understanding laid aside to strive upward as much as you can toward union with him who is beyond all being and knowledge. By an undivided and absolute abandonment of yourself and everything, shedding all and freed from all, you will be uplifted to the ray of the divine shadow, which is above everything that is. But see to it that none of this comes to the hearing of the uninformed, that is to say, to those caught up with the things of the world, who imagine that there is nothing beyond instances of individual being, and who think that their own intellectual resources, they can have a direct knowledge of him who has made the shadows his hiding place. And if initiation into the divine is beyond such people, what is to be said of those others, still more uninformed, who describe the transcendent cause of all things in terms derived from the lowest orders of being, and who claim that it is in no way superior to the orders of being, I'm sorry, superior to the godless, multiform shapes they themselves have made? What has actually to be said about the cause of everything that is? Since it is the cause of all beings, we should posit and ascribe to it all the affirmations we make in regard to beings. And more appropriately, we should negate all these affirmations, since it surpasses all being. Now, we should conclude, we should not conclude that the negations are simply the opposites of the affirmations, but rather that the cause of all is considerably prior to this, beyond privations, beyond every denial, beyond every assertion. This, at least, is what was taught by the blessed Bartholomew. He says that the word of God is vast and minuscule, that the gospel is wide-ranging and yet restricted. To me, it seems that in this he is extraordinarily shrewd, for he has grasped that the good cause of all is both eloquent and taciturn, indeed wordless. It has neither neither word nor act of understanding, since it is on a plane above all this. And it is made manifest only to those who travel through foul and fair, who pass beyond the summit of every holy ascent, who leave behind them every divine light, every voice, every word from heaven, and who plunge into the darkness where, as Scripture proclaims, there dwells the one who is beyond all things. It is not for nothing that the blessed Moses is commanded to submit first to purification, then to depart from those who have not undergone this. When every purification is complete, he hears the many-voiced trumpets. He sees the many lights, pure and with rays streaming abundantly. Then standing apart from the crowds and accompanied by chosen priests, he pushes ahead to the summit of the divine ascent. 
And yet he does not meet God himself, but contemplates not him who is invisible, but rather where he dwells. This means, I presume, that the holiest and highest of the things perceived of the eye of the body or the mind are but the rationale which presupposes all that lies below the transcendent one. Through them, however, his unimaginable presence is shown, walking the heights of those holy places to which the mind at least can rise. But then he, Moses, breaks free from them, away from what, what sees and what is seen, and he plunges into the truly mysterious darkness of unknowing, here renouncing all that the mind may conceive, wrapped entirely in the intangible and the invisible. He belongs completely to him who is beyond everything. Here, being neither oneself nor someone else, one is supremely united to the completely unknown by an inactivity of all knowledge and knows beyond the mind of knowing nothing. So again, the unknowability of God connecting to the unknown God as described in Acts. Now we're moving to chapter 2, and this is how one should be united and attribute praises to the cause of all things who is beyond all things. I pray we could come to this darkness so far above light, if only we lacked sight and knowledge so as to see, so as to know, unseeing and unknowing that which lies beyond all vision and knowledge. For this would be really to see and to know, to praise the transcendent one in a transcending way, namely through the denial of all beings. We would be like sculptors who set out to carve a statue. They remove every obstacle to the pure view of the hidden image. And simply by this act of clearing aside, they show up the beauty which is hidden. Now it seems to me that we should praise the denials quite differently than we do the assertions. When we made assertions, we began with the first things, moved down through intermediate terms until we reached the last things. But now as we climb from the last things up to the most primary, we deny all things so that we may unhiddenly know that knowing uh, that unknowing which itself is hidden from all those possessed of knowing amid all beings, so that we may see above being that darkness concealed from all the light among beings. Chapter 3. What are the affirmative theologies and what are the negative? In my theological representations, I have praised the notions which are most appropriate to affirmative theology. I have shown the sense in which the divine and good nature is said to be one and then triune, how fatherhood and sonship are predicated of it, the meaning of the theology of the Spirit, how these core lights of goodness grew from the incorporeal and indivisible good, and how in this sprouting they have remained inseparable from their co-eternal foundation in it, in themselves and in each other. I have spoken of how Jesus, who is above individual being, became a being, a true human nature. Other revelations of scripture were also praised in the theological representations. In the divine names, I have shown the sense in which God is described as good, existent, life, wisdom, power, and whatever other things pertain to the conceptual names of God. In my symbolic theology, I have, dis- I have discussed analogies of God drawn from what we perceive. I have spoken of the images we have of Him, of the forms, figures, and instruments proper to Him, of the places in which He lives and the ornaments He wears. I have spoken of His anger, grief, and rage, and how He is said to be drunk and hung over, of His oaths and curses, of His sleeping and walking, and indeed, of all those images we have of him, images shaped by the workings of the symbolic representations of God. And I feel sure that you have noticed how these later come much more abundantly than what went before, since the theological representations and a discussion of the names appropriate to God are inevitably briefer than what can be said in the symbolic theology. The fact is that the more we take flight upward, 
the more our words are confined to the ideas we are capable of forming, so that now as we plunge into the darkness, which is beyond intellect, we shall find ourselves not simply running short of words, but actually speechless and unknowing. In the earlier books, my argument traveled downward from the most exalted to the humblest categories. Taking in on this downward path an ever-increasing number of ideas which multiplied with every stage of the descent. But my argument now rises from what is below to the transcendent, and the more it climbs, the more language falters. And when it has passed up and beyond the ascent, it will turn silent completely, since it will finally be at one with Him who is indescribable. Now you may wonder... (coughs) Sorry... Now you may wonder, why is that? After starting out from the highest category when our method involved assertions, we begin now from the lowest category when it involves a denial. The reason is this. When we assert what is beyond every assertion, we must then proceed from what is most akin to it. And we do so, and as we do so, we make the affirmation on which everything else depends. But when we deny that which is beyond every denial, we have to start by denying those qualities which differ most from the goal we hope to attain. It is not closer to reality to say that God is life and goodness rather than that He is air or stone. Is it not more accurate to deny that drunkenness and rage can be attributed to Him than to deny that we can apply to Him the terms of speech and thought? Chapter 4, that the supreme cause of every perceptible thing is not itself perceptible. So this is what we say, the cause of all is above all and is not inexistent, lifeless, speechless, mindless. It is not a material body and hence has neither shape nor form, quality, quantity, or weight. It is not in any place and can neither be seen nor be touched. It is neither perceived nor is it perceptible. It suffers neither disorder nor disturbance and is overwhelmed by no earthly passion. It is not powerless and subject to the disturbances caused by sense perception. It endures no deprivation of light. It passes through no change, decay, division, loss, no ebb and flow, nothing of which the senses may be aware. None of all this can either be identified nor attributed to God. Chapter 5. That the supreme cause of every conceptual thing is not itself conceptual. Again, as we climb higher, we say this. It is not soul or mind, nor does it possess imagination, conviction, speech, or understanding. Nor is it speech per se, understanding per se. It cannot be spoken of, and it cannot be grasped by understanding. It is not a number or order, greatness or smallness, equality or inequality, similarity or dissimilarity. It is not immovable, moving or at rest. It has no power. It is not power, nor is it light. It does not live, nor is it life. It is not a substance, nor is it eternity or time. It cannot be grasped by the understanding, since it is neither knowledge nor truth. It is not kingship. It is not wisdom. It is neither one nor oneness, divinity nor goodness, nor is it a spirit, in the sense in which we understand that term. It is not sonship or fatherhood. It is not nothing known to us or to any other being. It falls neither within the predicate of non-being nor of being. Existing beings do not know of it actually is, and it does not know them as they are. There is no speaking of it, nor name or knowledge of it, darkness and light, error and truth. It is none of these. It is beyond assertion and denial. We make assertions and denials of what is next to it, but never of it. For it is both beyond every assertion, being the perfect and unique cause of all things, and by virtue is preeminently simple and absolute nature, free of every limitation, beyond every limitation, 
and it is also beyond every denial. And that is the end of pseudodynicity as mystical theology. So you can see the apophatic nature to what he is doing there. And this exerted, again, a tremendous impact on the development of Christian theology, Christian mysticism. And so uh, that is it. There you have it. So let me know what you guys think. Do you like Pseudo-Dionysius? Did you like the mystical theology? Um, I apologize for coughing. I apologize for a couple stumbles there while reading. I know that kind of breaks up the train of thought. But uh, let me know what you guys think. Please leave a comment in the comment section. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you know anybody that might be interested in this content, please send them our way. So that being said, uh, again, thank you guys for all the love and support. Um, if you have some ideas, maybe some uh, ideas on Christian mysticism for future videos, make sure to leave them in the comment section. And thank you guys again. I appreciate all the love and support, and until next time, God bless.